Good morning. Boy, it's good to see each and every one of y'all in person. <laughs> I know me and Terry, we hadn't had a chance to get in here for the last, oh Lord. Since March. Since March. It's been a while. They've had me on lockdown at the children's home over there. So uh, I'm sneaking out. <laughs> so, but uh, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. Today we start our Advent season. Our Advent services for this year begins today and continues for the next three Sundays. During these services we will have special activities that bring to light the meaning of Advent and how we may celebrate it in our lives today. Let us think of Jesus of being to prepare our hearts for a celebration and for his second arrival. Determines God's will. Asking God to give us directions. A man's hearts plan his ways, but the Lord determines his steps. That is Proverbs 16 and 9. This year, we would like to dedicate our services in memory of a special lady. Most of you know Miss Elizabeth Betty Rogers. Miss Rogers was a special friend to many in this congregation. She called us her family, and we loved her dearly. She served as a missionary in Africa and other foreign soil, of which we supported as a church body. Miss Rogers was instrumental in the beginning of the Advent services that we continue to have today. We hope that we are carrying on something in her memory that touches someone's heart and opens their minds to the glory of Jesus Christ. Let's think about the meaning of Advent. Advent can be defined as to come to and refers to the coming of Christ. This refers, first of all, to our celebration of Christ's birth at Christmas, but second, to the coming of Christ in our lives through grace and finally to his second coming at the end of time. Let's look at a short video defining Advent. Waiting. The action of staying where one is. Time passing expecting something to happen until one day it does. Advent is a time of waiting, of hope, of anticipation. God tells us in Galatians that when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. Advent is the church in waiting, the church's yearly reminder each December of what Christians worldwide anticipate in the days before Christmas. We wait for Christmas as Israel waited centuries for a savior, for God to fulfill his covenant. They waited for a virgin son to Abraham's line, a descendant of Isaac, Jacob, and David, for a branch from the rod of Jesse, for a baby born in Bethlehem called Emmanuel. For generations, God's people waited for the fulfillment of countless Old Testament prophecies of a savior who would light this world brighter than any Magi star. Jesus was the long-awaited hope to a dark and sinful world. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. As Christians wait for the light of Christmas, the four Advent candles are lit with each week's passing, and blue decorates the altar to receive our King with hope. But we know that our hoping and waiting doesn't stop at Christmas because he's coming back on the last day, a second advent. So as we hope for Christmas, we continue to wait and pray for our Savior to come again. A 
Another definition focuses on the past and the future with this explanation. Advent symbolizes the spiritual journey of individuals and a congregation as they affirm that Christ has come and he is present in the world today and that he will come again in power. One writer talked about Advent being the season of preparation, the time that we should examine our lives and think about how we are preparing ourselves for Christ when he comes again. If you think of preparation, would you agree that we should always be preparing ourselves, not just at the Christmas season? Certainly a celebration of Christ's birth and the preparing for the second coming are the major considerations when defining the true meaning of Advent. Today we will light our first candle in the Advent wreath. This candle represents hope. May we be constantly reminded to put our trust in Christ, for he is the hope of the world. Please stand and join us in a special reading and song. The words will be on the screen. As the world around us covers us with the shadow of despair, let this candle burn brightly into the darkness. For the overwhelmed, the overworked, the overwrought. For the underappreciated, the undervalued, the unnoticed. For the unhappy, the dissatisfied, the discordant. For the hungry, the sad, and the angry. For all who are swimming in the shadows and whose path is overgrown with unanswered questions. For all who wait upon the Lord, we are illuminated by God's hope. Now we will sing the Little Town of Bethlehem. As we remember the true meaning of Christmas and what we are preparing for in our lives, we think of the past, the present, and the future. Let us pray for the hope of deliverance from sin, to be mindful of the reason for the season, and hopeful for peace that will abide in the second coming of our King. Ephesians 4, 4 through 7. There is one body and one spirit even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, 
our Father of all fathers, dear Lord, as we start this Advent scene, dear Lord, let us reach down inside deep into our souls, dear Lord, as we take a strive upon this earth, dear Lord, to bring Advent not just today, but every day, dear Lord. Lord, we thank you for the hope that there is of, that we do have an eternal home one day, dear Lord, that we can look for the second coming, dear Lord, when you can take us to be with you. Lord, we just ask your your blessings upon your service today. Bless each and every one that is here. Meet their needs, dear Lord, if they have anything, dear Lord. Give them hope, dear Lord, that they can turn to you in time of need. All this we ask in your precious and holy name. Amen. Today we're going to talk about being lost and then found, okay? How many of you have ever been to a carnival or a really big store before? Okay, we all have, right? And there's lots to do there, right? Lots of things to see and it's a fun things, maybe even places you go into that are different. What do you think would happen if you got lost inside of one of those places? You think mom and dad would come find you? I think your parents would go. I think they would go and find you. I don't think they would go home without you, do they? Do you? No. Do you think they would be worried? Yes. Um, well, let me ask you this. What if you had 12 brothers and sisters and one of you got lost? Do you think they would be worried about you then? Yeah. Yeah. Even though it doesn't matter how many you would have, brothers or sisters, um, your parents wouldn't say, oh, we have plenty of kids. Let's just go home without them. They would keep looking for you, wouldn't they? They would not say that. No matter how many children there might be in your family, each and every one of you is special. And I'm sure your parents would do everything they could do to find you if you were lost. Well, when Jesus was on earth, crowds of people came to hear him talk. Many of those who came were people who did bad things. And Jesus was glad that these people came to hear him, and sometimes he would even eat a meal with them. Some people who went to church all the time would get upset. They didn't think Jesus, Jesus should spend time with those kind of people. So Jesus told them a story. The story comes from Luke chapter 15, verses 4 through 7. Suppose only, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep but you lose one of them. Then he will leave the other 99 sheep alone and go out and look for that lost sheep. The man will keep on searching for the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, the man is very happy. He puts it on his shoulders and goes home. He calls to his friends and neighbors to say, Be happy with me because I found my lost sheep. In the same way, I tell you, there is much joy in heaven when one sinner changes his heart. There is more joy there at one sinner than there is for 99 good people who don't need to change. Jesus wanted the people to know that when one person who does bad things decides to quit doing those bad things and to start following Jesus, there is more joy in heaven than for 99 people who don't need to change. So this week, I want you to think about that, and as we're out and about, I want you to be a light and lead others to Jesus, okay? Because we're always having to look for that one more, okay? That one lost person so that we can teach them about Jesus. So in your bag today, you're going to have your sheet, and make sure that you do your work, okay? All right. Amen. We appreciate Ashley and our young folks so very much. Amen. Why don't we just give them another hand of appreciation today? Uh, 
Brother Nathan's going to be coming in just a moment and ushering us into the presence of the Lord, but we just want to say to you today, we're so glad that you're here. Thank you uh, to Keith and Terry for uh, kickoff of another wonderful Advent season, and I appreciate them so much uh, honoring Sister Betty in our memory this year. Just a touching moment in that. And uh, There's so much that needs to be covered this morning in a very quick amount of time. I'm going to do my best to do that, but... I just don't think it would be proper if we skipped out on what took place here this past Tuesday night without saying uh, thank you to our ladies, uh, Loretta and her team. I just think we ought to give them a hand of appreciation. And um, you hear me say real often, you don't want to miss this. And if you missed it, all I can say is you just missed it. Amen. Just ask some of those that were here. And uh, it was a wonderful meal and a wonderful night. And we are. Uh, we appreciate that so very much. I've been asked also to remind the youth, of course, you're going to be playing a very important part in all that's going on in this month of December. So if you want your young people to be involved in that, we encourage you to do your best to try to have them here on Wednesday night. Uh, Ashley and her team are working with them. Also as well, next Saturday at uh, 1.30, I believe, they're going to be practicing right here in the Bridge Building. Uh, so we just encourage them uh, to be here. As well as next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, I want everyone to listen because everyone in the Shiloh family is invited here next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Next Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we're going to be decorating the inside of this beautiful building for the glory of God to celebrate and to kick off our month of December. And then next Sunday morning, we invite you to bring an ornament from your family. Those of you that have been here for a number of years fully understand that. Uh, we're not going to spend the entire service on Sunday morning decorating the tree as we normally do. We're going to take a small portion of that time and come forward, and we're going to celebrate together as a family. And, uh, but we're going to have everything else decorated. The tree will be put up on Saturday morning. Bags will be filled to be able to give out this year for Christmas. So you don't want to miss being here and being a part of what's going to go on next Saturday morning. Next Sunday morning, we would invite you to bring an ornament to go on the Shiloh tree. And during our service, if you've never been a part of the Hanging of the Greens, we're going to have this whole sanctuary already decorated. And then we're going to take the time during that service to come and place your ornament on the tree. It should be something that is special to you that links you to Shiloh and to this church family. And uh, we encourage everybody to do that because as those ornaments are placed on that tree, we do it in memory of God's blessings upon us throughout this year. We're very, very excited to be able to do that again. Uh, as well as at the end of today's service, we're kicking off the spirit of giving for the month of December. Because you see, Jesus Christ gave the greatest gift that could ever be given when He come and He gave Himself for us. We picture Jesus as a baby in a manger, but He come on a mission. And the mission was to bridge the gap between fallen man and a perfect God. And the only way to bridge that gap was by the supreme price that only heaven could pay. And it was called the Son of God. We know Him as Jesus. But he come for the sole purpose as a babe in a manger, no more to be, but to be the bridge that would bring fallen man back to the grace of God. That is the true celebration of this season. And we want to enhance that by calling this year's Christmas simply, Come Home for Christmas. There have been a lot of us that have been scattered in various ways. Even in conversations in this building this morning, I've heard people say, I've been missing being here, but I really didn't know what to do. I don't know whether to go or I don't know whether to stay. And you as well as myself, we all experience those sentiments oftentimes because there are so many challenges and they change before us every single day. But one thing is consistent and one thing is real. God is for us. And the Bible declares unto us, if God be for us, it really doesn't matter what is against us. 
And so we want to celebrate today with the theme throughout this season of Christmas, Come Home for Christmas. So each Sunday throughout this month of December, we're going to be celebrating in a little different way this year. Beginning with next Sunday morning, all hearts come home for Christmas. It's going to be a very special service where we bring the family of God together, we decorate around a tree, and we celebrate the true meaning of Christmas. And yes, there's going to be a special guest here next Sunday morning. So you want to make sure that your children and your grandchildren are here because next Sunday morning is going to be a great celebration of what coming home for Christmas really looks like here in the sanctuary. On the 13th, we're going to celebrate with Christmas at Shiloh a musical Sunday in celebration of the songs that we familiarize Christmas with as well as the joy of the Lord. And then on the 20th, we're going to celebrate with an old-fashioned Christmas program simply entitled The Savior's Birth. And we want to encourage you to come and to celebrate. Preacher, I don't feel much like celebrating. My heart's heavy. There's a lot going on. Jesus is the reason for the season. And I pray for those that are in this room and those that are unable to be in this room, that your hearts are heavy today. I pray that the peace of God that passeth all understanding and the joy of the Lord will resonate in your spirit throughout this Christmas season like it never has before. I'm not talking about a laughter joy, but I'm talking about a deep peace that can resonate in a man or woman's heart and a confidence in knowing that all is well because God is there. Can somebody say amen? At the close of our service today, we're going to begin that very reason to resonate the joy of giving. God laid it upon my heart. We've already given as a church through our annual expense as we normally do for Falcons Children Home. But Tuesday night, God just whispered in my spirit and said, you need to do something extra this year and open it up to the entire body of Christ. And so I announced to you yesterday and those of you that were here Tuesday night that this morning at the close of the service, we're going to be given a special gift that's going to brighten a child's Christmas in Falcon, North Carolina this year at the children's home. So whether you can give a dollar or whether you can give a thousand dollars really doesn't matter. What matters is at the close of this service today, we're going to come and when Brother Terry Paul comes and closes out our service and has our prayer, before you exit that door, we invite you just to come by and drop that offering in this basket this morning that's been decorated with this red bow. As a reminder, God, we're giving something into your hands to be a blessing to someone else because I believe personally that's where Christmas really begins, blessing others. Can somebody say amen? We're glad you're here today. Today's going to be a very special service. Before we turn it over to uh, Brother Nathan this morning, I just want to say to you that the two small poinsettias that are given today by Stan and Joanna Chance in honor of Sister Beauty Brewington and in loving memory of Johnny Brewington and Freddie and Blanche Chance. And I want us today to especially remember Sister Beauty and her family. Most of you probably don't know in this room this morning, but Sister Beauty had to be rushed into emergency surgery last night. And our hearts are heavy. But she came through the surgery and is doing well. What is painful about this experience is that none of her family are able to be there with her. Now, this is not a new story. It's been repeated over and over and over now for months in our nation. But it's a sad occasion. Because when our loved ones are hurting and suffering, we need to be able to be there with them. And I pray that that will soon change. But today, I thank God that His peace that passeth all understanding prevails in our lives. As we begin this service today, repeat it along with this family and literally thousands of other families across America today that are in a situation that's very similar to this. I want us to stand together, welcome God's presence, and simply say, I'm glad to be home for Christmas. But God, there are those around me today that are hurting. And we want to remember them in prayer. Let us pray together. If you will stand. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as we welcome you into this place today, I 
Thank you for all that has been done. The beginning of the Advent season. The message of hope that we are waiting for. There is a hope in Christ Jesus. There's some good news that is not being shared. There's some good news that's not being celebrated. Lord, if we look to all that is going on around us, our hearts become heavy. We become overwhelmed for Sister Beauty and her family and thousands of others just like them. But God, there's some good news today that needs to resonate within our hearts. And I don't want, Lord, this tone of this service to be a, a mundrun or a Debbie Downer. I want this to be a joyous day. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. And I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now, Father, in the midst of circumstances of life, that is not possible outside of the good news of Jesus Christ. But in Jesus, there is hope. <laughs> I thank you for the hope of the Advent season. In Jesus, there is hope. And today, we celebrate the hope of Christmas. We celebrate the joy of coming home for Christmas. We celebrate the miracle of Christmas. We celebrate the blessings of being a part of the family of God. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this house. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We invite you today to do in us and through us that that you desire to do. We thank you for that that has begun. Thank you for our kids' ministry and all that is going on. But God, I believe that the message that needs to resonate in this building today is simply this. There is hope in Jesus Christ. Paul said it best all those years ago when he said, If this was all the hope that I had was in this present life, I of all men would be most miserable. But Paul knew as well as I know today that there is a hope beyond that that I see. There is a hope beyond that that I feel. <laughs> and there is a deep settled peace that abides within the heart of those of us that know you today. We celebrate that hope that is called Jesus Christ. May that news go forth today. May it resonate and settle within each of our hearts and in our lives. When we leave this place today, May it be renewed in each of us. We ask it today. In Jesus' name we pray as we come home for Christmas. Amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor before you see it. Throw up that hand. Give them a big smile. Let them know you love them. Let them know you appreciate them today. Let us worship the Lord together today as your Good morning, church. How many of you know there is no place like home? That's about four people. Evidently, you don't like where you're staying at. How many know that there's no place like home? You go on vacation, you're so excited to go somewhere, but three days in, you're like, man, I'm ready to get back to the house. But how many know there is a earthly home and there is a heavenly home? And church, we're closer now than we have ever been before in our life. We're so close we can see the finish line. And church, I pray this morning as I sing this song, listen to the words carefully. If I've not sung this song once, I've sung it 50 times within the last two days for to prepare for this morning. Because it's such a powerful service. I didn't even know we was going to be talking about going home for Christmas. I totally forgot about that part. But that's just how the God works and instilling it in you if you'll listen to him. But church, I pray this song be a blessing this morning. Are you disappointed? Are you desperate for hell? You know what it's like to be tired and only a shelf of yourself. Or well, you start to believe you don't have what it takes. Cause it's all you can do just to move us, let's finish the race. But don't forget what lies ahead. Home, old home, brother, it won't be long. Soon all your burdens will be gone. With all your strength, 
sister, run wild and free. Hold up your hand, keep pressing on. We are almost home. Well, this road will be hard. We win in the end. Simply because of the Jesus in us. If it's not if, but when. So take joy in the journey, even when it feels long. Oh, find strength in each step, knowing heaven is cheering you on. We're almost home, brother, it won't be long. Soon all your burdens will be gone. Run wild, run free, hold up your hand, keep pressing on. We are almost home, almost home, almost home. home. I know that the cross has brought heaven to us. But make no mistake, there's still more to come When our flesh and our bone are no longer between We are right now where we're all meant to be When this hall has been lost and made whole again When these tears and this pain no longer exist No more walking, we're running as fast as we can Consider this our second wet almost home Brother, it won't be long. Soon all the burdens will be gone. With all your strength, sister, run wild, run free. Hold up your hand, keep pressing on. We are almost home. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 That's all right. Amen. I think sometimes we forget there's a finish line. Amen. We get caught up in everything going on around us, and we forget there's a finish line. Amen. That's the good news that people are forgetting to report. Amen. Praise God. There's going to come a day when you stand in the presence of a true and living God and you're going to feel the breath of God on you. And you know what you're going to feel? You're going to feel Him blowing you back when He simply says, Well done. <laughs> Thy good and faithful presence. Hmm. Hallelujah. He's going to step out and He's going to say to you, You've been faithful over a few things. Come on in. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when the God of this universe says, come on in? You ever knocked on anybody's door and heard them say, come on in? There's going to come a day when you're going to step out on the portals of glory and you're going to hear God the Father say, come on in. The finish line is in sight, church. Don't you lose hope today. Amen. I know, I know the world around us is in turmoil, but I'm going to tell you, the child of God is at peace today. I'm talking about a peace that passeth all understanding and overwhelming joy that we can't even explain, nor can we understand, neither can we describe it to anyone else. Amen. God is good. There's some good news that ain't nobody reporting. Amen. Now, you can turn on your radio. You can turn on your television. You can pick up your newspaper, and they're reporting a whole lot of stuff. But I want to tell you, there is some good news that there's nobody reporting. And the reporting is that we still win. Amen. Amen. COVID don't win, amen. 
pandemic don't win, Jesus wins. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And home is right around the corner. Yes, we've been speaking now for the last few Sundays about can I trust God. Amen. And today I want to talk to you about the good news that no one is reporting. And you see, I had a desire to stand before you this morning and uh, present to you the message in the normal realm, but yet God stepped in and intervened. And uh, so I just want to invite you today, if you will, to come along with us on a journey to WGOD where we will be joining our host, Anna Grace Jackson, for the program, You've Got Questions and We've Got Answers. Come along with us this morning. Good morning. How are you today? All right? One moment, one moment, one moment, one moment, right here. One moment, right, 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 right here. Okay, okay. Lights, camera, action. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this blessed and beautiful morning. Today we have Pastor, Pastor Eddie Smith from Shiloh Pentecostal Holiness Church joining us on our program to discuss putting your trust in God. Thank you for having me this morning. I'm very excited and I appreciate WGOD for inviting us to come along and uh, be on your program today. We're very excited about this and it's kind of an unusual thing because we have been celebrating and talking about for the last few Sundays the topic, Can We Trust God? And we've covered many subjects along that line, but today I was simply scheduled to cover uh, the subject, the good news that no one is reporting. And then, wow, right out of the blue, you give me an invitation to come on your program today at WGOD, and we're just so excited about that this morning, and we thank you so much for having us today. The pleasure is mine. So tell me, Pastor Eddie, how would you describe who God is? What are some of God's qualities? Wow. How would I describe God? Wow. It's an overwhelming question. But it's a question that I think deserves an answer. How would I describe God? I feel the best thing for me to do is turn to His Word and maybe let God describe Himself. Because He tells us in Psalms chapter 46 and verse 1, He says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's what God says to us about who He is. But I think what really matters is, is the DNA of God. What makes God who He really is, is what He says. And what He says is simply this, I am your refuge. I am that that you can run into. I will provide for you strength for whatever circumstance that you're facing, for whatever situation that you are facing. You see, Miss Anna Grace, is it all right if I call you Anna Grace? Thank you. Anna Grace, I have some folks in our church right now that are going through a very difficult time. There are many of them that have not been able to come and be a part of our fellowship on Sunday morning like we normally do. and um, They've not even been able to come in the building. Many of them have been deprived of that all across America, not just in our local church body, but people all across the America that had a normal tradition of getting up on Sunday morning and getting dressed and driving out to their place of worship and walking in a building and celebrating who Jesus really has been and is in their lives. And all of a sudden that was taken away from all of us when a mandate came down and simply said that we could not assemble together. I would have never thought such a thing would have taken place in the land that we call America. But it did. But thank God we had a righteous judge that stepped in and said because of separation of church and state that the state could not mandate that the church could not assemble together. So God opened the doors of our facility, but meanwhile, until we were able to walk back in this building, uh, our church and many other churches around us 
we figured out a way that we could come together and worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we brought in a flatbed trailer and we just come and we celebrated Jesus as a church family. We had to do it from our automobiles where we were separated and couldn't be together. But we broadcasted through the radio and we still celebrated Jesus. Then the judge passed the ruling that we were able to come back in the building and many did come back, but yet we had to stay six feet apart. We weren't able to fellowship in our normal manner and still are not able to do so. Many are having to wear masks and uh, we're doing all the things that we can as far as sanitation and all of these things to make sure that those that do come in the building are protected and taken care of. There are those that are still joining us from the parking lot and many have never even come back and done those things but are joining us online and Yet even in the midst of that arena, there has been, thank God, for uh, programs just like this where we're having exposure. The Samson Independent has given us a platform, an opportunity where we've been able to uh, share our message of the good news of Jesus Christ that, by the way, so many are not reporting. But I thank God for programs like yours, Anna Grace, that are celebrating who Jesus is. But back to your question Your question simply says, who is God? And what I want us to focus on is what His Word said. And His Word said that in our time of need, He would be strength. In our time of pain, He would come to our aid. In other words, He said, I will provide for you. I will be your refuge, your strong tower, your high tower that you can run into. So in the midst of all of this that has been going on, all of the pain and the hurt and the suffering, God has provided for the church and the body of Christ a deep settled peace that passeth all understanding. It's been a peace that I've not even been able to explain to people. Just a comfort in knowing that the God that I serve, that He's got me. And I just feel that overwhelming presence. And I think it's because of what He said. He said, I will be a refuge for you and I will provide strength for you, he tells us. And then he goes on and he says, I'm going to be a very present help in your time of trouble. So I think as we focus on what God says, it brings us a better understanding of who God is. God is my help in my times of trouble. And trouble just doesn't stop with us not being able to assemble together but it goes into many different arenas of life where families can't get together any longer for Christmas and for Thanksgiving and the things that we normally do. We have family members that have loved ones in the hospital and they're not able to go and visit them. And all of those things are very painful. But our focus is simply this. God is my refuge. God is my strength. God is my peace in my time of trouble. I've heard this said best most recently. I don't know how anyone that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior can make it through this present life. Who is God? God is peace. God is love. God is joy. And God is strength. Thank you. So you're telling me Even in times of hardship and trouble, God is always willing to help us, even when you examine the state of our world today? Miss Santa Grace, there's not words in my vocabulary for me to express to you today what I really want to say. So again, let us turn to the Word of God. And it says, therefore, we will not fear. Did you hear that? And he goes on and it says, even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though mountains shake with its swelling. The Bible says in verse 4 of Psalms 46, and I want you to hear this. I'd like for your viewers to hear it today. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, 
God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. Did you hear that? God is telling us in His Word first who He is, what He is, what He provides, and then God says there is a place. Let's use this analogy if we may. I have a shower at home, I'm sure you do. I can walk into my shower, into my bathroom where we go and we take our shower and as I did this morning and I reach in behind that shower curtain to that very familiar place and I turn on that water. And all of a sudden, I always do that because I'm kind of a sensitive type guy. I know you can't look at me and tell it, but I don't like to step in that shower and turn on that water and all of a sudden I get that cold burst. I'd rather let that flow first and then I step in the shower when it's at my temperature. But one thing I've noticed about God, God says there is a place a river, he describes it. I'm using the analogy of the shower head and the water flowing out of it. You see, Anna Grace, I could get in my bathroom and reach in and turn on that shower faucet and the water begin to flow. And I could stand there and I could look at it and I could listen to it. And I could be sweaty and hot. I could be dirty from a day's work. But I could stand there and look at that water. I could even hear that water. But unless I step into the place where the water's flowing, I'm never going to know and experience the refreshing of that shower. And the same thing remains with the hope that is in Christ Jesus. The good news that so many are looking beyond. God says there is a river whose stream shall make glad the city of God. But if I don't position myself in a place where God can bless me, where God's refreshing can flow on me, I may hear it, I may see it, but it will never change me till I position myself in the place where God can refresh me. Very similar to that shower. Can you imagine for a moment if I went into the restroom hot and sweaty and stanky? Yeah, we say stanky in Sampson County. I turned the water on and I stood there and looked at it and I listened to it. Got my clothes back on, walked back out. Tammy would look at me and say, I thought you were going to take a shower. And I'd say, I did. And she'd say, well, you're still dirty. But yet many of us will go to the house of the Lord and we'll sit down on church pews and we'll hear the message of Jesus Christ, the good news that so many are not telling. But we don't ever position ourselves in the place and open up our heart where God can refresh us and cleanse us. And we walk back out that door unchanged. We have to allow God access to our heart so that we may know that He is my refuge and that we may know that He is my strength, so that we may know that He is our provider. And as we walk in Him and we taste Him and we experience Him and He refreshes us and we become new in Christ Jesus, everything changes in our life. Yes, I do have to say to you today, God is our strength, God is our refreshing, and yes, He is a present help in our times of difficulty. Thank you. But Pastor Eddie, look at the condition the world is in. We have a pandemic running rampant, there is great division across the land. Heck, we don't even know who our next president is. There is great poverty across the world, extreme weather, and nations rising against nations. Where would you say God is right now? If he cares about us so much, where is he? You know, that's a very good question, Anna Grace. Where is God right now? Do you believe God is a gentleman? If I come to your house, like I always had before, 
and I sat down on your chairs and I moved to your tables at your meals. When it was time for you to get up and go to school, I went along with you to school. Let's say that something happened and you had to go to court for some reason. And I come along with you there. But let's just say one day, Anna Grace, that you looked at me and you said to me, Look, Pastor Eddie, I don't want you coming to my house anymore. Pastor Eddie, you're not welcome to go with me to school anymore. And by the way, Pastor Eddie, you're not invited in our judicial system anymore. Matter of fact, I believe we'll just take your name off of these things because you're no longer welcome. If I was a gentleman and you asked me not to be there, I would withdraw my presence from you. Could it be that in America today that we have asked God out of so many places that he doesn't feel welcome any longer? And I think it must really begin in my heart where I open my heart. Because you see, Anna Grace, realistically, I don't control the school systems. I don't have an opportunity to control what goes on inside of a courtroom. But I do control my home. But wait, even now, in America, that's being challenged. I'm told today that I can't have any more than 10 people in my home. We're talking about realistic things here this morning. And I'm told that if you come and visit me in my home, because we don't live in the same home, even though I've invited you into my home, that you know you need to do things and I need to do things because now I'm even being told what I can do inside of my own property. You know, I think back many years ago when it first began, we said, God, we don't want you in the schools any longer. I may can't change the world, but I can change me. And I can say when I get up in the morning, God, I want you to go to school with me today. I can say, God, I want you to go with me to work today. And first and foremost, God, you're welcome at our eating table. And we're going to reverently pause and say, thank you, Father, for being here and providing for us the things that you have. And first and foremost, God, you're always welcome in our home. Because as for me and my house, we're going to serve you, Lord. So in the midst of your question, where is God now? I believe God is right where we will allow him to be. Because God said, I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will go with you all the days of your life, even to the ends of this world. So God's wherever we want him to be. God shows up in some unusual places. We've seen God through the word show up in a lion's den. We've seen him show up in a fiery furnace. So I believe God will show up in COVID if we ask him to come. Thank you. So you're saying God is big enough? and loving enough to take care of the whole wide world, myself included. But how exactly? Wow. I'm so glad you asked. Because you see, I refer back to his word. Because what really matters is not what I say, but what God says. So I want to read to you Psalms 46 and verse 10 when it says, be still and know that I am God. 
be still and know that I am God. If you ask me today, how can God do all of this? I'm not really sure there's an answer to how He can other than the fact that He says, I am God and I can do all things. So let me answer your question this way. Maybe it would be easier for me to simply say, I don't know how he can, but let me tell you what he has. On a Sunday night many years ago, for all the wrong reasons, I was sitting in a church. A man by the name of H.B. Tullington preached the gospel of Jesus Christ in a fervent and powerful way. He preached hell so hot that night that I felt like I could feel the flames lapping all around me. God had already been working on my heart because I had a praying mama that refused to let me go to hell. And every night she would pray, God save my boy. Because he's headed down a wrong path and if you don't intervene, God, he's going to hell. And on that Sunday night, sitting in that church, H.B. Turlington said, would you come? A friend of mine sitting beside of me looked at me and said, would you like to go? And I got up and I walked down that aisle and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. God, forgive me of my sins that night. Anna Grace, I wish I could say to you that from that day to now that I've been a perfect individual and have never disappointed God and have never failed Him. But that would be a lie. Ooh, that would be far from the truth. I've failed Him so many times. But on that night, Jesus Christ did something for me that I could not do for myself. He forgave me of my sins. And it started a new life in me. It hadn't been a perfect road. It's been more failures than success, to be honest with you. But this God we're talking about, He's been real to me. In the wee hours of the night, when nobody else knew, God would walk in the room because I invited him down. And we would talk. And I was so ashamed because of so many things that I had done as far as failures. But I never found any condemnation in him. He just always come and loved me and forgave me. On my journey, there have been so many times when I didn't know which way to turn. And I would pray. And I can remember as a young convert, I used to think, God, I just wish you would write the answer on the sky. I remember saying that to him. But one day, he finally got it through my head. He didn't write the answer on the sky because he wrote the answer in the book. And when I began to turn to the book, I found answers for all my questions. I found a peace that passed all understanding. I found a joy that was overwhelming. I found peace and comfort. When I was lonely, he was a friend. When I was hungry, he became meat. When I needed comfort, His arms embraced me and each time along the way that I've needed forgiveness, He was there. The journey's been rough. It's been highs and it's been lows, but not because of Him, but because of me. But God has never one time, ever one time refused me. Even though I couldn't understand it, God was always there always tugging at me, me not fully understanding that that was his spirit working in me and cultivating me and doing in me. 
And it's amazing after all of these years of journeying with Christ and walking with Him and having a few success and finding more failures than success, for the very first time in my life, even after serving God and ministry and pastoring a church, last year I took a trip to Rome, Georgia. And at Rome, Georgia, I had an encounter with God because the very first time in my life I saw God as He truly is because my entire life and my entire journey with God had been based upon a lie. It was based upon a judging father setting over a huge desk with a gavel in his hand, looking down on me and my struggles and in my disappointments, just waiting for me to mess up so he could club me over the head. Again, I failed. But last year in Rome, Georgia, I was invited to a table very much like this. And there were three chairs there. It was a oval table, not like this one. But there were three chairs sitting around that table and then a chair for me. And God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit were sitting at that table. And I was invited to come just as I am and sit down in the presence of a true and loving God. He wasn't there to judge me because His Word says that He came not to condemn me, but that through Him... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, I might have life and have it more abundantly. And for the very first time in my life, I saw God as He truly is, giving me an invitation to come and sit in His presence, to have a conversation about where I am, to invade my privacy and open myself up in His presence, And then God be able to do a work in me. And to me, be able to get up and walk away from that table. And God look at me and say, but wait, son, there's something else. And see him dispatch his spirit to come along with me. That from that moment on, that I'm never alone. never alone, and His presence always abides with me. I don't have to particularly go back and sit down at that table because I'm always in that presence, but I'm always invited. There's no condemnation there. There's no judgment there. There's simply grace, mercy, and love. That's the good news that no one has reported. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only begotten Son that whosoever would call upon the name of the Lord would be saved. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And we all need to be sharing it. Thank you. Well, Pastor Eddie, what you've had to say is pretty enlightening and even encouraging. I think I'm going to start spending some time in my own Bible. I want to see what else God has to offer. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Anna Grace. Maybe today, you as well need to come home for Christmas. Can I just say to you this morning that God is love. 
We condemn ourselves. We judge ourselves. God loves you. God is for you. But I don't want you to miss this this morning. You have to position yourself in the place where the blessing flows. It's not about walking in this building and cutting on the shower and going back out that door unchanged. You're still unclean. You're still dirty. And you're still lost. But if you'll get in the presence of God, His love will forgive you. May we bow our heads this morning. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that this simple message of the good news that no one is sharing, I pray that it may penetrate every heart that is in this building as only you can. May I share with you in closing this morning a story. I'm sure that I may have shared it at some time in the last ten and a half years here. But the setting of this story was many years ago. This young lad had gone down to this lakefront property. The water was inviting. It was a summer afternoon. And he decided, wow, I believe I'll just slip off my trousers and step into this lake and refresh myself. The only problem was the young boy couldn't swim. Just a young teenage boy being foolish as we all have been. By himself, he wades out in the water. Man, it felt so good on his shins and up to his knees. He took a few more steps and now he's waist deep in water. Ooh, it feels so good, refreshing he is. And he's playing around, lollicking in the water and first thing he knows he's chin deep and then off in a hole he steps in over his head. Crying and screaming and bobbing in the water not knowing how to swim. Passerby is coming, riding out on a beautiful afternoon. He's mounted his horse and got his buggy and just taking an afternoon stroll, he and his dog. He pulls back on the reins of that horse, hearing the cry and the scream from the lakefront, sees this young man bobbling in the water, jumps out, takes his coat off, dashes out into the water, rescues the young boy and pulls him safely to the shore. A few years pass. The young man hadn't changed his ways. He's still getting into stuff that he doesn't need to be into. And he finds himself on the wrong side of the law. Yes, he has a court date. He's walking before a judge. But the sentence could be death. Walks into the courtroom and the young man looks up and he recognizes that the judge serving on his case is in fact the same man that on an early afternoon many years prior had jumped into a lakefront and rescued him and pulled him from his drowning breathing a sigh of relief as the case progressed the judge came forth with the sentence and he says these words as of today this court finds you guilty 
My choice is today to choose by the law that I serve the penalty of death for the wages of your transgressions. Is there anything you'd like to say, young man? Yes, Your Honor. Evidently, you don't recognize me. But many years ago, on a beautiful afternoon, you jumped off of your horse and buggy and made way into the lake and you pulled me from that water. Surely the man that rescued me would not sentence me to death. The judge clears his throat and with one sigh makes this statement, On that day, I was your Savior, but on this day, I become your judge. Church, the Bible says this is the day of salvation. Choose this day whom you'll serve. Because the God that is your Savior today, one day, will become your judge. Is there anyone in this building this morning that would like to step out from where you're at and simply say, Father, forgive me, for I have sinned. I need a Savior today, and I believe you're Him, Jesus. Is there one? Just going to wait one moment. I'm not going to wear on the congregation this morning. Those of you that are joining us from the parking lot, if all is not well with your soul, just go ahead and bow right there where you're at and invite Him into your life. No, you can't physically get up and walk down to this building, but I believe you can make that place an altar. Those of you that are viewing on the Internet, is there anyone today that would just simply say, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior? Because I can promise you there's coming a day when that Savior is going to turn into a judge. This is your opportunity. There's going to come a day when Jesus is going to make a statement, ready or not, here I come. It could be today. Nathan sang to us this morning so beautifully, we're almost home. I can see the finish line. We're almost there. There's a great story that's not being told. We win. But you've got to be positioned in the right place. And if all is not well in your heart, you're not going to heaven. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. But the Bible says no sin is going to enter that sea. Is there anyone today? If not, we'll close in prayer and I will leave this message between you and God. And then we're going to invite Brother Terry Paul to come. And he's going to have our closing remarks. And please remember those of you before you leave this building today, if you will, present that gift for Christmas for Falcon's children. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for a beautiful job done by Anna Grace today. Father, I thank you for giving us an opportunity once again in a little different format to be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I just pray that it touches people's lives and changes us. If there's any lost among us, I pray that it goes home and resonates with them throughout the afternoon till they find an altar and they find a place of repentance. Lord, for those of us that know you, I pray that this will be a gentle reminder today that we need to make sure that Jesus and the good news of the Lord and Savior is being shared through this Christmas season. It would be a great time to come home for Christmas. Father, add your blessings to everything that has been done here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Anna Grace a hand this morning. Come on, Brother Terry and Paul. Amen. Thank you so much, Anna Grace. Thank you.
spoiled, spoiled as a worshiper. And I believe all of us should be because we're blessed that our pastor is the hands and feet of our Father. That he lays out the program for his children and our pastor's sheep. I wasn't expecting this this morning. I don't know about y'all, but I can't think of a better program or sermon or inspiration that we all needed this morning because not only did I hear the word but we got to see a family atmosphere that we could relate right at our home because I could see one of our children and me supposed to be the man that God created in his image should have been telling my children of the blessings because it's not as bad for us as it could be but as long as we put him first in our life we can overcome and it will be good one day if we just humble ourselves and come unto him and again I'd love to just for us to just give appreciation, a hand of appreciation for Brother Nathan, Brother Keith, and him. So good to see you back. So good to see you back. I'm looking for others to come on back home and not miss this opportunity because we can hear it, but if we don't see it, sometimes it just don't dwell within us because some of us through family have been through situations this year that we have already overcome because he has kept us under that hedge of protection. And I thank him for it because he was spoiled because we've got a pastor and sister Tammy that prays for us continuously. We've got brothers and sisters in here that pray for us continuously. We're blessed this morning. We're blessed this morning. We shouldn't be saying I'm blessed this morning because he has given us that in this house of worship this morning. And I'm going to hush right here. I'm going to hush right here because that's what I needed this morning to see that family of the light shining. Uh, Miss Anna Grace. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for our children to... I can do that. I can do that. I want you to pattern to doing what Miss Anna Grace did because our pastor I talked to you just like and listened to you just like he listened because it wasn't a script it wasn't laid out as a program it was laid out as a lesson for us to take and live by don't forget the bucket here we've got children over there in Falcon that we saw a program and that blessing that we give, a beat will be blessed several times over. But I think of the blessing that that child will receive from us. Let's not hold back because we get so many things in return from him. We can never outgive him. And I encourage y'all today, be safe going on. And not forget Wednesday night. And like Pastor Eddie said, wiping off sometimes might get us by. But I'm looking forward to taking a shower because there's some things that's not clean like they need to be within me. Let us continue to wash. Let us continue. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for such a lovely day that you've given us. We thank you for this message today that I cannot think of one that didn't need it. I can't think of a child that was up here on Sunday school lessons that didn't need it this morning. I can't think of a person that was too old to hear it this morning and not take it back home with them and use it this week or until they return 
and bow their heads to you say, Father, I needed that today. I needed the song that was sung today. I needed the fellowship that, I, that I've had with my brothers and sisters today. Father, I ask you for, to, to keep us within your grasp. I want it to be where we can enjoy coming into the house of worship better than we can even sit at home because they're taking so much restrictions on us, but we can be free in here, in your presence. And that's what I pray for, that we will run to freedom. And the only place we're going to get it is in the house of worship. Lord, we ask you to be with us until another time. Touch those that need a special touch from you this morning, Father. I have an aunt and we have a sister that needs a special touch this morning, Father, along with others. Father, be with us. Bless those from the children of the falcon there and bless us to give. But more importantly, let's come back Saturday. Wednesday night and Saturday and let us join in on decorating your house and let us feel at home again like we did this morning, Lord. And I thank you. Father, it's your grace, mercy, and blessings that I ask for. Be with us. Keep us safe, Lord, until the another appropriated time. In the name of Jesus, to our almighty Father, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, this is the month we celebrate and worship you and honor you, Lord. And let us not fail in that. In the name of Jesus, to our almighty Father, the Lord of lords and the King of kings, I say thank you. And the congregation and brothers and sisters says, Amen. Thank you. She has an announcement she needs to make.